Welcome to the Gospel Truth Show produced by Cross and Crown Radio. We want to make a lasting difference in your life and in our community. Our mission is to produce biblical, entertaining, and Christ-centered programs for God's people and folks all around the world. Post a comment or question and sit back and enjoy the show. GospelTruthShow.Podbeam.com Hello, this is Cross and Crown Radio and the Gospel Truth Podcast, and I'm Mike Robinson. we got a great show today, wonderful show. It's going to be very, very interesting, very fascinating. What we're going to be talking about is extra-biblical sources of the life of Jesus, specifically rabbinical sources on the crucifixion of Jesus. You don't want to miss this. Great evidence for seeing who Jesus is and what he did from hostile sources. Before we start, though, if you could give us a subscription, it really helps. And the question of the day is this. What evidence is the most powerful that you've seen that convinces you that Jesus Christ is the Messiah? Let us know. Put that in the comments. We really appreciate it. But today's topic, Christ's crucifixion and rabbinical sources. Rabbinical sources are just those sources that the rabbis wrote, or that actually was part of oral tradition and written down around 200 AD. But the tradition goes back before Jesus was born, through Jesus' life, and just a little bit after his life. Those sources talk about Jesus, and they have some great details. Let me read you from Sanhedrin 43. It says this, On the eve of Passover they hung Jesus, or Yeshua, the Nazarene. And a choir went out before him for 40 days, declaring, Jesus the Nazarene, or Yeshua, goes forth to be stoned because he practiced magic. Anyone who knows odd in his favor, let him come. And they found nobody in his favor, and they hung him on the eve of Passover. Wow. And then it gives a, a, a reason why they should hang him on Passover. That's all the way back in the time of Jesus from hostile sources. Very, very powerful. That's Sanhedrin 43. Remember these, these extra biblical sources, especially the rabbinical sources, could be the Targums, they could be the Talmud, they can be the Mishnah. If you want to look those up and, and put those in Google, check those out, what they are. I won't take time to define those. Now Jesus declared that he was God. In John chapter 3 it says this, no one has ascended into heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is, the Son of Man who is in heaven. And Jesus said this, Most assuredly I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. He said that in John chapter 8, verse 58. The word I am, though, goes back to Exodus, where God told Moses who he was, the I am. So Jesus is declaring himself God. And it says in the book of Revelation that Jesus declared in chapter 1, verse 7 through 8, that he's God Almighty. In Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, it tells us that Jesus will be a son given and he shall be mighty God. So we know this about Jesus, that he claimed to be God, that he was God. And notice what the rabbi said in Jesus' day. Rabbi Abihu said this, If a man says, I am God, he lies. If he says, I'm the son of man, he shall rue up. If he says, I shall go to heaven, he said, he shall not perform it. That's what the Jerusalem Talmud said about Jesus' life. Now, there's many, many other sources that talked about Jesus, giving him different names. And it says this, that Rabbi Ishmael did not let him go heal somebody. He said, you are not permitted, Ben Dama, because Ben Dama wanted to heal somebody in Jesus' name. Notice that all the way in the first century, even non-Christian Jewish people wanted to heal in Jesus' name. He said, I will bring you proof that he may heal me. But he had no opportunity to bring proof because he died. Rabbi Ishmael said, Happy are you, Ben Dama, for you have gone into peace and you have not broken down the fence of the sages, since everyone who breaks down the fence of sages, to him will punishment be ultimately met. Whoever breaks the fence, a serpent shall smite him. That's found in the Babylonian Talmud. And so right there is describing a guy who was a non-Christian Jewish person. Remember, most of the Christians at that time were all Jewish. So there are Jewish Christians and non-Jewish Christians. And this non-Christian Jewish person wanted to heal in Jesus' name. But one rabbi said, don't do it. And he died before he had a chance to do it. And the one rabbi said he was blessed for not partaking in the name of Jesus. Now it goes on to say, in Zerah 27b, when Rabbi Joshua ben Levi's grandson had an obstruction in his throat, a certain man came and whispered into his ear a spell in the name of Jesus, the well-known heretic. And he began to breathe again. So notice, this guy's healing in Jesus' name. 
calls Jesus a heretic. As the man was leaving, Rabbi Joshua asked, What did you whisper in his ear? And the man said, Such and such a spell. And Rabbi Joshua said, It would have been better if my grandson died rather than recover. So he talks about this guy recovering through a Jewish guy who wasn't a Christian, invoking the name of Jesus and asking God to heal him. That's wonderful. That's incredible. Now we're going to get into really more, a lot more of these, and we're going to give you a summation of many texts that talk about Jesus in rabbinic literature, including his crucifixion, including healing in his name. After this brief commercial, it's about 30 seconds. Stay with us. We appreciate you being with us so far. Hey, guys. Please subscribe to our channel. It really helps us a lot. Additionally, don't forget to join our Full Access Media Experience. We want you to know that Cross and Crown Full Access is now available for just $7.99 a month. Full Access provides an enjoyable Christian media experience. Every day we produce biblical, entertaining, and Christ-centered programs for you on demand. Sign up for Cross and Crown Full Access and get every television show, the after show, a free book monthly, and all our academic work at your command. All just one click away at gospeltruthshow.podbean.com. Help us reach the world. Now, a synopsis of the rabbinical literature, that would be the Talmud, the Mishnah, etc. I would encourage you, to, if you're a Christian, get familiar with these things, especially the Targums. There's so much incredible evidence about Jesus in there. Why? Because the Targums... They talk about their little commentaries in Aramaic uh, uh, before Jesus was born. And in these Targums, we can see that the Jewish people at the time of Jesus, especially the scholars, took these certain prophecies that Jesus fulfilled. Remember, he fulfilled over 300 of them. And dozens and dozens and dozens of these, the Jewish people themselves say, yeah, this is a prophecy about the Messiah. So they said this before Jesus even came. So those who say, oh, you just kind of wiggle and, and, and move that prophecy around and stretch it to have Jesus fulfill. It's not really Jesus. No, the hostile sources recognize that these prophecies were for the Messiah. Now, rabbinic literature says this. Number one, that Jesus was born under unusual circumstances. Isn't that interesting? They say that in quite a few different places. Number two, it says that Jesus was tried and convicted and sentenced to death. That's what rabbinical sources tell us. Notice how it's showing us that what the Bible said, we already know it's true, it's got to be true, but it's interesting to see that these things confirm what the Bible has already revealed about Jesus. It said Jesus was crucified on the eve of Passover, just like the New Testament says. It says that Jesus made himself alive by the name of God, at least his followers thought so. That Jesus claimed to be the Son of God and God. That's what the Bible says too. When Jehovah's Witnesses or other cultic groups say Jesus never claimed to be God. Well the Jewish people sure thought he did. Because it's in their literature. It says, and they said that Jesus would return again. That that was the claim. That Jesus claimed a kingdom. That Jesus had disciples. That Jesus performed miracles. That Jesus' name healed people. Including some non-Christian Jewish people. So that's really, really interesting. Now, let me tell you a little parable. And an old man is worried that his wife of 50 years, he's really worried about her, that she's losing her hair and she's becoming deaf. So he's really, really concerned about it. So he, he consults a doctor and the doctor suggests that he try a little test for her to see if she's really deaf. And so he, he says, I want you to do this. I want you to stand behind her 25 feet and, and ask her the question. And then I want you to get, uh, if she doesn't answer, I want you to get close closer, get 15 feet and ask her a question. And then if she still doesn't answer, if she's still not hearing you, I want to get you, I want you to get right up to her and ask her a question and see if she responds. That way we can see how deaf she is. Because she won't go to a doctor. Okay? So he comes in and then he sees his wife and she's standing by the refrigerator and he gets within twenty five feet of her and he says, What's for dinner tonight, honey? No answer. So he gets fifteen feet to her, maybe even closer, a little twelve feet to her. And he asks, What's for dinner? Still no answer. Finally, he gets right behind her and he says, Honey, what's for dinner? And his wife turns around and says to him, For the third time, I said chicken. <laughs> Indeed, we can see that many, many unbelievers 
You give them evidence after evidence, and they say, hey, you haven't given me any evidence. You give them sound proof after sound proof. They say, ah, oh, you haven't given them any. What I encourage you to do is, number one, give them more and more, because there's so much. Everything in the universe is proof and evidence for God. It's either proof, evidence, or both, right? Well, you can see that clearly. So there's so much that you can just keep going out of. But beyond that, give them the law and then give them the gospel. What is the law? The law shows the, the unbeliever as well as us that we need a Savior. It shows how we've broken God's law and we're sinners. So you, you, you press in a gentle, caring way, patient way, the law of God on their heart. Even admit how you've broken it. You don't have to get really specific, but mention how you've broken it and how we all need a Savior. So give them that more and more as you're talking to them. Because you know what? What the end of the day is all these atheists, all these agnostics, they truly do know that God exists. They're just suppressing that truth and unrighteousness. And since they know God exists, what they do is they're trying to play a game. They want to be an atheist and get attention. They want to be an agnostic to get attention. It brings them some attention on the internet or with their family or both. And so that's what they're doing. And they think at the end of the day, you know what? They say to themselves, I'm a pretty good person, so I'll be okay uh, because God exists. That's okay. He'll, he'll still accept me. No, they need to understand how all men, all of us, have broken God's commandments. We all have failed morally at times. And we need a Savior. And the only Savior is Jesus. Now, why do I believe in Christianity? Number one, because of God's grace. His Word and Spirit came to me and opened my heart. So the Holy Spirit has changed me. I've been regenerated by grace alone, through faith alone in the Gospel. So also, intellectually, why do I know that Jesus is the only... Why do I know the Bible is the truth? Because of the impossibility of the contrary. It has to be the case, because only the Christian worldview can supply all these pre-essentials... Uh, including universal immutables that are necessary to have truth and knowledge and reason. Since we have truth, knowledge, and reason, God must exist as the ontological foundation. As Ventel said, the ontological trinity is our starting point, okay? So ontology has to precede epistemology. In other words, what actually is the case, what actually exists, what is, what exists ontologically that has to start the process that's the foundation to be able to understand what is actually out there what we can know so ontology in my view the ontological trinity proceeds our knowledge okay so we have to understand that another reason why I believe in God and believe in the in in Jesus is the Bible the proof in archaeology is incredible you can't see that with the Book of Mormon you can't see all that with all these other false texts but the Bible page after page after page has archaeological proof they used to say you know what the Hittites don't exist until the 20th century when they found archaeological proof that they did and all of a sudden the skeptics had to back up they used to say that about Pontius Pilate until the the near the end of the 20th century when proof was found about Pontius Pilate same with the town Nazareth same with many other archaeological finds over and over again so that and one of the big ones is the over 300 predictions about Jesus Christ that all came true in one guy and that was Jesus prophecy after prophecy after prophecy came true in the life of Jesus so where he was born was predicted in Bethlehem and the Targums also assert the same thing that this prophecy in Micah is about the Messiah same with the prophecies in Isaiah they say, yes, these are prophecies of the Messiah. And of course, those were written and known before Jesus was born, communicated before Jesus was born, and Jesus fulfilled all of those, over 300 of them. That's incredible. That's powerful. The, the, the mathematical odds on that are more than there are atoms in the universe. There's your mathematical proof, the prophecies of Jesus. Now, the resurrection of Christ. No other religious leader ever rose again. No other religious died for our sins, like we read from the rabbinic uh, resources, and then rose again on the third day. Only Jesus. Then I could go on with the cross. I can go on with justification. All these are unique to Christianity. Sin. Only the biblical worldview says all men everywhere, all times has sin. We see that as incredible proof just to see how many people have actually sinned. The DNA, the language within the DNA is so powerful. Logic, the laws of logic, the law of non-contradiction, the law of excluded middle, the law of identity. These things never change. They're perpetual. They're fixed. They're immutable. And they're, they're universal in application. Everywhere present. Only God, who has universal power and scope and is immutable, can account for these laws. 
and Jesus. Most of all, Jesus. No one is like him. Think about how all of it's all of it is condensed in Christianity. No other worldview has someone like Jesus, where no one ever spoke like Jesus, nobody ever loved like Jesus. Yes, the same God. Nobody ever had this prophetic 300 predictions about his ministry predicted before he was born. Only Jesus. No one died on the cross for other people. Only Jesus. No one rose again from the third day. Only Jesus. No other holy book has all this archaeological proof. Only the book that talks about Jesus. Notice how all that is condensed into Jesus and Jesus alone. Very, very powerful proof. So, this is Pastor Mike Robinson. I'm so glad you joined me. If you're an agnostic, if you're an atheist, if you're a person that hasn't walked with Christ for a while, this is your opportunity. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, starting with verses 1 through 4, that this is what the gospel is, Paul said. The content of the gospel is this, that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried and rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. Right now, wherever you are, put your faith and trust in Jesus. Understand that you'll be saved, you'll have a place in heaven, you'll be accepted by God, by grace alone, as you put your faith in Him alone. So trust in Jesus alone, and He will be there for you, and you will have a place in heaven if it's sincere, if you truly, truly believe in it. This is what you must do. Turn from your ways, trust in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, by grace alone, through faith alone, and you know what? Now yours own. And so until next time, may God bless you. Thanks for joining us at Life Church today. It's our joy to play a role in all God is doing in and through your life. We would love to continue with you on that journey. If you have any questions or prayer requests, visit lifechurchtoday.com or email us. We offer free counseling and a free Bible school because we train numerous people into ministry. Use your talents and answer God's call. God wants to do so much for you and through you. If you would like to give, click the donation button on the site. Pastor Robinson's 40 books are on Amazon. Welcome to the Gospel Truth Show produced by Cross and Crown Radio. We want to make a lasting difference in your life and in our community. Our mission is to produce biblical, entertaining, and Christ-centered programs for God's people and folks all around the world. Post a comment or question and sit back and enjoy the show. Gospeltruthshow.podbeam.com Amen. 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 Moses, a covenant man and an Old Testament prophet, married a black African woman, and it was approved by God in Numbers chapter 12. And then it says, Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Cushite woman whom he had married, for he married a Cushite woman. Cushite means a, a woman from Cush, obviously, which is a region south of Ethiopia <laughs> in Africa. So then God gets angry. He gets very, very angry for Miriam for criticizing Moses. This criticism has to do with Moses' marriage <laughs> And Moses' authority. See, it always goes, sin always goes back to authority, that we question authority. That's one reason many criminals do not like police and judges. It has to do with their authority. They may not even know them personally, but they hate the authority. So here we see, though, in this passage, the most explicit statement relates to the marriage. Miriam and Aaron, they're the, the, the siblings of Moses, spoke against Moses, and it says this, because he had married a Cushite woman. Then God, God's anger, God's holy anger at Miriam, Moses' sister, rises up. And God says, in effect, you think light skin is supreme, Miriam? Okay, I'll make you light skin. Let's see how you like it. When all of a sudden, whack, here comes a cloud, rolls in, and drops what appears to be something from the sky. And what it is, it gives Miriam leprosy to where now she has completely white skin, as the Bible says, white as snow. So then the cloud departed, and Miriam was left with this leprosy until she repented. Wow, you come against God and his man and his authority. You hold some racism. Oh my, God hurled leprosy on her from a cloud. 
Talk about germ warfare, huh? We see here a sin and a cloud and leprosy. And God does not utter one negative word against Moses for marrying a Cushite woman. But when Miriam criticizes God's chosen leader for this marriage, out of the sky in a cloud, God strikes her and strikes her with leprosy. Somebody say amen to that, right? Amen. That's God. So Moses also had a problem with leprosy. In the Old Testament, there's seven cases of leprosy that are expounded. And Moses, many scholars think, had leprosy also in Exodus chapter 4. Remember the burning the bush in Exodus 3? God comes and says to Moses, I am that I am. Tell them, that's who sent you, right? Well, in Exodus chapter 4, Moses objects when God tells him to return to Egypt and confront Pharaoh. And God has Moses put his hand in his shirt. Now remember, that's kind of a covenant sign that I'm going to either receive your covenant or not. He puts it in his shirt, but when he pulls it out again, look, all of a sudden God strikes his hand with leprosy. His skin was covered with scales, white as snowflakes, it says. A small infliction on Moses. But when he obeys and he puts his hand back into his shirt, which is a sign, I receive your covenant and the promises. He pulls his hand out again and is healed. This demonstrated to Moses God's sovereignty and that God heals. Even when we blow, even when we mess up and we think, I can't even look to heaven and ask God to heal me or bring deliverance. No, you rest on the cross. You rest on Jesus and you ask heaven and guess what? Heaven will answer. Someone say amen. 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 Isn't that good news? It's not about us. It's about Jesus. Yes. Another time of leprosy was Uzziah. In fact, he's the last one mentioned in the Old Testament when we discuss leprosy inflicting a man, King Uzziah. He was from the house of David, a royal house, and he had a long and glorious reign. And he grew in pride and was full of haughtiness and bravado. So one day, this king is full of himself. He decided to go to God's house, the house of the Lord the temple of God, and to burn incense himself. But God revealed only the priest could do this, pointing that there's only one way to heaven, and that's Jesus. Uzziah initiated spiritual war, a spiritual war against God. For Uzziah was confronted by dozens of temple priests, men of God, who challenged him on the spot. It's time for a divine showdown, and God has all the big guns. But when the king got frustrated and irritated, he became livid. Then suddenly, out of nowhere, boom, the rumbling of an earthquake started to shake, rattle, and roll through the temple. An earthquake struck the area, and look, oh my, God strikes the king with leprosy. It says leprosy <laughs> broke out in Uzziah's forehead. Then Uzziah repented and let the kings expel him, for it says the Lord had afflicted him. Uzziah had to turn his kingdom over to his son Jotham. And live the rest of his life away from his people because of this. Another case of leprosy in the Old Testament was Naaman. Remember him? He was a general of generals. He is the guy that would be the joint chiefs of staff head of his day. A military leader of one of the region's most powerful nations. Under the world standards, a powerful man, a mighty man, a man of great authority. And the Bible says Naaman, commander of the army for the king of Aram, it says was a great man. The man was a brave warrior, it says. So he's a commander, he's great, he's brave, highly regarded, victorious, courageous, fearless. Here's a guy with power, position, and status. He was effective, he was a winner, he was wealthy, he was a hero, he was valued, he was well regarded, he was respected. But he had not run up against a man of God, a man with heaven's back. A man of God with humility and faith and power. He had not yet met such a man. And Naaman, it says, had leprosy. All he could think about was his leprosy, not all of his successes. Each time he looked at himself, he had to label himself a leper because that's what he had. The harsh reality was Naaman was a leper and leprosy was the Ebola of his day. Lepers were isolated and shamed. They were outcasts. They were the real untouchables. Naaman. Well, people treated him with respect. Now nobody wanted to touch him. A lack of touch hurt Naaman. Can you envision walking throughout life, all your life, and nobody touching you? His leprosy was defining his life. <laughs> Naaman, the office, officer of high stature, discovers the divine cure, the treatment from a humble prophet named Elisha. Naaman, the well-to-do noble officer, is healed in a dirty river in the Jordan. But when Naaman arrives at Elijah's rustic commune, 
He's about to see the real power, real authority, and real glory. For prophets have that effect on people, don't they? Right. Prophets don't hold back. They don't. They do lack diplomacy many times. And Naaman nearly rejected his chance of healing by getting angry at the prophet Elijah. Because Elijah did not show up to greet him at the door. Here's this big military leader with his entourage comes to his door. And Elijah does not even get up from the couch. Amen. <laughs> Elisha did not show him honor by greeting him at the door. For Elisha had no respect for a pagan officer. He only respected heaven's throne. Amen. So Elisha had no pretext. He didn't care. He didn't give a hoot. He was about his father's business. He didn't read Miss Manners. He may not have been sensitive, but he had the cure. He may not have displayed niceness, but he had the remedy. And Amen wanted it. This man of God to celebrate his arrival, put on a big loud display of honor and heal him because he's such a great man of valor. <coughs> Yet God uses humble people in powerful ways, often ordinary means, to bring extraordinary effects. Someone say amen. 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 Elijah's prescription for healing was weird. Right? Right? <laughs> Tell the person next to you. Sometimes God asks them to do odd things. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Elijah's prescription for healing was weird, was odd, very, very strange. But God loves to challenge men, what men think is normal, by calling us to do weird things. That's one reason so many of us are oddballs, amen? We are strange because we're strangers in a land, because we love God with an infinite love, and we want to love others with that same love. The eternal love, an unconditional love, an amazing love, all from Jesus. Glorious Jesus, marvelous Jesus, wonderful Jesus. And so in the text, Elijah cries out, Thus says the Lord, Go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored and made clean. What? Really? Come on. No way. This is crazy. This is bizarre. This is loony. Such a weird thing. And no way. This is crazy town. I'm a man of honor. I got my pride. I'm a military officer. The Jordan River, which means the descender. See, humility requires us to descend, to go low, to serve. So we descend into greatness. We don't rise in greatness when we're in the church. And so go to the Jordan River was to go down, way down, a symbol of humility. That's crazy, this officer thought. That's beyond the pale. Seven dunks in a dirty stream? Why, we have rivers in Aram that are much cleaner and purer than the Jordan. Naaman distrusted God's remedy. It's crazy. It's insane. It's abnormal. It's odd. It's bizarre. It's eccentric. It's strange. It's outlandish. It's flat out weird. It's unbelievable. No way. Naaman did not realize that the power was not in the water, but the power was displayed in the water by the power of God himself. Amen. Power is not in the act. It's not in the dunking. It's not in the water. It's in God. And so Naaman continued to doubt when he entered the Jordan and he came up still a leper. And God reminded him that when the Lord says seven, six will not do. Somebody say, yes, sir. Come on. You know. yeah. Six will not do if God says seven, right? God is asking some of us to dip seven times. See, humility leads to obedience. And remember last week where Jesus said to keep on asking, keep on knocking, keep yes. on praying. Yes. Here we see it. Amen. See, the humble person, when God asks seven times, the humble person does not try to get away with four or six. God wants us all to go all the way with Him. Amen. Tell the person behind you, go all the way with God. Go ahead. Go all the way with God. <laughs> they said it to you guys. The Bible says, clothe yourself with humility toward one another. Because God, notice this, God resists the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. Naaman was at least humble, finally. And in complete obedience to God's loving directions, then he was touched by God and healed. So it says, Naaman went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times, according to the man, according to the command of the man of God. Then his skin was restored and became like a small boy, very, very clean. So there are some cases of leprosy in the Old Testament. Now let's see how it all points to Jesus. It always, always goes back yes. to Jesus. In the New Testament, the lepers that Jesus sees. Jesus sees them and they say, Master. They see Jesus and they say, Master, what are you going to do when you get to heaven and you see Jesus face to face? First, you're going to fall on your face and say, Master, I've been waiting. 
I've been waiting so good to see yes. you, Master, right? So they see Jesus and they say, Master. And the lepers, even though they were outcasts of society, forgotten, diseased, throwaways, they'd seen Jesus. And that changed everything. And Jesus says, this is all he said. Go and show yourself to the priests. Wow. What does that mean? That you only show yourself to the priests if you've been cleansed. Mm -hmm. Jesus, just by his word, cleansed them. Amen. According to Leviticus 13, the reason why a leper would go show himself to a priest is because the priests were to examine them and then give them a ceremonial cleansing confirmation if they were in fact cleansed. So you imagine having that leprosy for a minute, a minute, all those people we just described, never touching so in the rest of your life, no massages, no soft shakes, shaking of the hands of a friend, no holding your baby in your parental arms. No little boy walking down the street hand in hand with the father or the mother. Lepers, they were neglected, they were banished, completely estranged from family and society and human touch. Leprosy, one rabbi said this, and Jesus said, he said this, When I see lepers, I throw stones at them, lest they come near to me. That's what one rabbi said. But greater than a rabbi is here. Greater than Solomon is here. Greater than Elisha is here. Jesus came on the scene. And see, as the world and the religious world banished the lepers, Jesus came to the lepers and stopped. He gave them full attention and touched them. The shocking truth is of mercy. For Mark says Jesus is moved with compassion. A stirring of mercy, a touch of restoration, shocking the onlookers who watched the deformed, scaly, scarred, covered, rejected man transform. So Jesus, the second case with the lepers, touches the untouchable. He loves the unlovable. While others were repulsed, Jesus was responsive. While others were shocked, Jesus had compassion. While others moved back, Jesus moved in. Amen? amen? And that's what we're to do. We're to follow Jesus. And everybody else leaves. We go in. Amen? Right. That's what the Christians do. Yeah. We bring the love in. We bring the mercy in. We bring the grace in. Yes. Another case. Jesus comes to some lepers and there's ten of them. Remember, lepers are the outcast, but not with Jesus. Jesus is always, always moving in mercy and grace. Thank God for Jesus. Amen. Thank God for mercy. That we can go to the throne of grace and receive mercy. See, the lepers, they were intensely low. It was highly contagious. Nobody wanted it. And in our lives, we can become so unthankful because of focusing on who we are instead of who Jesus is. If your life is all about you, if it's my life, we got a problem. But always remember... And own this, own this today if you get nothing else. Healing is a children's bread. Amen. Amen. Healing is a children's bread. But we lose the attitude. You see, mercy, mercy is not the same as grace. Grace removes the stain of sin when you can't see it no more. But mercy, mercy removes the sting of sin. The sting is in where you don't feel it no more. The cross heals you because of Jesus' pain. You don't feel it no more. There's no more power over you. You're forgiven. You're cleansed. You made a whole complete pardon. Everybody in this room who believes in Jesus, you've been completely, utterly pardoned. Pardoned and forgiven in Jesus' name. Receive that in Jesus' name. I'm talking about there's no more scars. That's where some of us still are. See, there are far too many Christians. You know you've been forgiven and cleansed of your sin. There's no longer that stain of sin because of the cross. The stain of sin. But there's still the sting of sin. I still feel a pain. I still feel a hurt. My heart is broken. The wound is deep. And it left a scar. A huge scar on my soul. You don't know what I've been through. But Jesus does. Yeah, yes. See, I'm talking mercy. Mercy removes the scars. When you're made whole, the scars fade. The pain and the shame are ripped from your soul. And you're made whole by Jesus. Jesus makes you whole. Thank God Almighty. Jesus is mercy incarnate. Yes. Jesus said, a bruised reed shall he not break. Jesus is wonderful. He's wonderful. But you don't know what I've done. You don't know my sins. You don't know all the things I've messed up. No, God forgives you. The cross is bigger than that. 
Tell the person next to you, we all need the cross. Go ahead. Amen. Jesus is the one with healing in his wings. For mercy, his mercy, the Bible says, endures forever. I'm talking about Jesus. Jesus is your salvation. Jesus makes you whole. He heals the wounds. He removes the scars. Yet many of us hold on to those things. So in that case, the last case we'll talk about, the leprosy, the ten lepers come to see Jesus. And Jesus just says, as I mentioned earlier, just go yourself and show yourself to the priest. See, so often we limit our faith. All we need, though, is the Master's voice, don't we? The Master's word. The Master's voice. For Jesus is the word, isn't he? But where's the evidence of thanksgiving and gratitude? The nine go, the one stays. The nine go, the one stays that had the leprosy. The nine didn't come and thank Jesus. The nine went and showed themselves to the priests so they can be confirmed as being cleansed. But see, this one guy who stayed, he was becoming where they were going. See, they were going to the priests. He was getting saved to become part of the kingdom of priests. See, they were going to show themselves to the priests. He became a priest. For the Bible says, all believers, you can see on the outline in Revelation 1, 6, all believers are kings and priests. Isn't that good? That we're part of the royal priesthood, as Peter put it. And that's why we can tell others about Jesus. So this one leper went back to Jesus. And this man, this leper, with a loud voice, said, I was loud. I was loud when I was in need. When I was asking God for something, I was loud. I pleaded, Master, loudly. I wanted to get Jesus' attention. And now I'm going to be loud after my healing. I'm going to give God praise because He deserves it. I'm going to praise Him. I'm going to honor Him. I'm going to lift up praise into my God, my Deliverer, my King, my salvation. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to get loud because God has been so good to me. See, Jesus and His mercy, I mean, it starts... It starts to feel good, doesn't it? It starts to feel real good. See, you, you understand His mercy, and then you also understand His grace, and you understand the distinctions, and yet they're together. Sometimes you don't feel good at first. Sometimes I don't feel like praising the Lord, you say. Well, that's emotion. Never lead your life on emotion. Let emotion follow God's Word. Amen? Amen. You don't deny your emotion, but they always have to follow the Word. I don't feel like praising Him. That's when you need. Yes. You need expression. Yes. When you praise Him for where you're at. No matter what's going on. Because you know what? He will deliver you. Amen. He will meet your needs. Always. Yes. Parts of my world may seem battered and shattered. But I'm blessed. You see God is more than enough. Someone say amen. amen. God is more than enough. He's a God of overflow. He's a God of too much. He's a God of fullness. He's a God of mercy and of grace. Yes. Notice what happens here. One of the lepers, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God and fell at the feet of Jesus and gave him thanks. Thanksgiving and worship. Worship and thanksgiving. Mm. See, Jesus had cleansed him. And that was good enough. He didn't think he needed anything else. He was a leper and now he's no longer a leper. But grace, grace is different than mercy. Grace is getting what you did not earn. Amen. See, mercy is not receiving what you did earn. Grace is receiving what you did not earn. See, to be cleansed as a leper means that the fingers were still gone. When you had leprosy, you lose your fingers, lose your ears and your nose, all kinds of things, your toes. So if you were cleansed, now you were healed but not restored, okay? So your fingers and your nose and your ears still may be gone. You were not whole, but you were healed. See, you go back to your family now that you had that certificate. Go back in your family because you're no longer contagious. But maybe the hand was gone. Maybe the nose was gone. Maybe your toes were gone. Maybe you could barely walk because of that. But you were cleansed. You could go back home. But they would see the scars, the horrible scars of that you had leprosy. Can you imagine the disfigurement? Everybody would know, oh, he once had leprosy, poor guy. Back home, they wouldn't ask what happened to you. They knew, <coughs> for leprosy left extreme scars. But going home, that was good enough for the other nine lepers. They went and got their confirmation slip from the priests, and they could go back to their families. See, we receive mercy, and sometimes... 
We think that's enough. But I want grace. I want God's great grace. Amen. Although parts of our body have decayed, these lepers thought, and have fallen off, we're going home. We're going home, and that's good enough. And the family would look at you and say, oh, don't talk about that. Here he comes. Right? And you felt guilt-ridden because nobody wanted to be around you because you once had leprosy. Nobody wanted to touch him. The family still kept their distance. Your room is over there, hon. It's over there. Well, what, what, what time's supper, Mom? Well, don't worry, hon. We'll, we'll bring your dinner to you. Right? Still, no one wants to be around you, even though you've been cleansed. The scars are still there. This is good enough for the other nine, but this one leper fell down on his face, giving God thanks. And the word says, by no accident, it says this, he was a Samaritan. I hope you own that. I hope you got that. I'll bring that out to you. See, Samaritans were racist against the Jews. And the Jews were racist against the Samaritans. They were bigots. Remember Miriam? She got leprosy for being a bigot, for being a racist. Remember that? And going against Moses. And this Samaritan comes up to the Jewish Messiah, Jesus. It says he was a Samaritan. Hated by the Jewish people. And Jesus said, Were there not ten cleansed? And they did not return to give God the glory. And he said unto him, To this guy, this leper, who's at his feet, still got all the scars, his nose, his ears are gone. He says, Arise and go your way. You've been made whole. Boom! The ears pop back, the nose pops in, yes. the toes are there, yes. the fingers are there yes. because of this man's gratitude and his faith and his worship. Jesus makes them whole. He yes. cleanses them. He gives them great grace, amazing grace. Don't you love God's grace? Give him praise yes. and honor today. God's great grace. He goes past the cleansing. As wonderful as that is, don't you love that? But he's made whole. The scars are gone. The sting is gone. The pain is risen. He now has fingers and ears and toes. That's grace. That's grace to remove your scars, to be whole again. You come to Jesus. You come with an open heart and say, Lord, all that I am, all the scars, Lord, you take them. I'm yours, Lord. Jesus, you alone. I know, Lord Jesus, you can heal. For Jesus says to you today in this congregation, arise and receive your wholeness in Jesus' name. Amen. See, I will end with one of the guys we talked about earlier. With this I'm done. Naaman. He's healed. He's submitted to God's word. And it says, His flesh became like the flesh of a little child. God healed this pagan, this sinner, with all the dirty deeds he did. All the mess he did. All that. God forgives him and heals him. And the sinner turns to him. Now Naaman then, after he's healed, there's something you might have missed. He offers a gift to the prophet Elisha. Elisha, though, he said, this is grace. I don't get nothing. This is free. This is grace. He refused to receive the gift. But note what you might have missed. Elijah's servant, Gehazi, became covetous. And it says in the text, Elijah's servant wanted something more. For Gehazi goes after Naaman to ask him for two silver talents and some beautiful clothes for himself. Yet God will not be mocked. As Elisha saw Gehazi seek after the greedy goodies, Elijah's greed, when suddenly God strikes Gehazi, and Elijah says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the leprosy of Naaman shall cling to you and your descendants. And Gehazi went out a leper, and the Bible says his skin was white as snow. It's all about grace. It's not about us. So as we close, look to Jesus. Look to Jesus. Because you're saved by grace and not by works. The Bible says clearly, the words that he uses, it's not of yourself. Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. Remember Jesus on the hill, on the cross at Calvary. Jesus, pain faced, thorn and bruised head, pierced feet, wrapped, pelted body on the cross. Jesus is so disfigured. He looks like a leper on the cross. 
Jesus on the cross, the anguish of infinite justice cast upon him, the miserable wave of sin, judgment, and torment hurled up and heaved up against Jesus on the cross. Jesus received all that because he loves us. He died for you and I because he loves you. He loves his people. He really, really loves you. Thanks for joining us at Life Church today. It's our joy to play a role in all God is doing in and through your life. We would love to continue with you on that journey. If you have any questions or prayer requests, visit lifechurchtoday.com or email us. We offer free counseling and a free Bible school because we train numerous people into ministry. Use your talents and answer God's call. God wants to do so much for you and through you. If you would like to give, click the donation button on the site. Pastor Robinson's 40 books are on Amazon. Good afternoon, this is Cross and Crown Radio and the Gospel Truth Podcast. I'm Mike Robinson, your host. we got a wonderful show today. We're going to talk about who Jesus is and what he's done on the cross. Okay, I've heard that a thousand times. No, we're going to try to go deep. We're going to try to inspire. We're going to try to motivate. We're going to try to have us embrace the cross and get so close to Jesus like we've never been before. So let's pray. Father, fill us with your spirit today in Jesus' name. Give us your word and spirit by your grace that we would honor the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus, amen. Now it all starts at the cross. Jesus on the cross, what a picture. Look at that love. Look what love has done on the cross. Just ponder this for a moment. Contemplate on the cross for a moment. Think about all the aspects of love and grace and mercy that manifested on the cross because of God's love for us. Think about the tortured Savior, Jesus on the cross for you and for me. Count the wounds. Estimate the sacrifice. Jesus loves you that much. When the nails went through Christ's right hand and through Christ's left hand, he bought you heaven and his heart and himself. And Jesus now says, you are mine and I'm yours. If you've turned from your ways, if you left all that behind and come to Christ and you trust that he died on the cross for your sins, he was buried and God raised him from the dead of the Son of God, you have eternal life. You've been born again. And as Jesus said, you must be born again. Christ's left hand bought you heaven. When his nail went through Christ's right foot and Christ's left foot, that brought you forgiveness and mercy and eternal life. Jesus now says, oh dear one, I will do anything. I will go anywhere. I will pay any price. I will make you mine. I will love you more than eternity will ever reveal to you. And I do that starting at the cross and through the resurrection and the ascension. Why? Because Jesus is so wonderful. He's so amazing. Jesus is so stupendous, so beautiful in holiness, marvelous in deity, greatness and grandeur as God manifested in the flesh. Jesus is so loving, so merciful, so good. And one day we shall put our arms around his neck and say, Oh Jesus, Oh Lord, I love you. I absolutely adore you. Oh Jesus, you are mine and I am yours. My whole heart is yours. Today, right now, Christian, non-Christian, give Christ your whole heart. It's not just about emotions. It's not just a matter of saying, okay, I'm going, to, I'm going to start doing this or doing that. It's a matter of life. It's a matter of casting all that you are upon Christ, who he is, and what he has done. He died on the cross for our sins, and then we're justified as we trust in him. All of our sins are washed away, and the righteousness of Christ is imputed to our account, and that's good news. To say to Jesus, here and forever, you're mine. For today, Jesus stretches out before you two wounded hands and he calls you afresh to come come to jesus come to the cross come to jesus he takes away all your shame all your guilt all your depravity all your sin all your pardon you're forgiven 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 if you truly come to jesus it's gone you can hear my dog in the background she feels like she's gotten something today also so hopefully you have 
but it's deeper and more profound than anything that the animal kingdom can comprehend or contemplate. It's about God and the kingdom of God coming down through Jesus into our lives. So come and see his glorious ascension because one day we will be glorified. We're, we're justified, we're sanctified, and one day we'll be glorified. For Jesus is the marvelous one, the altogether lovely one, the king who gave it all for you. With, with all that you are, come to Jesus. As I've been doing this for decades and so blessed to be able to preach the gospel and to share Jesus. For me, all the books, all the work, all the ministry, all the people, all those things are so important and they've been really, really wonderful and such a great gift. I delight in all those things, but nothing, 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 nothing compares to Jesus. Make it simple. Yes, there's profound things out there. There's transcendent things out there. There's supernatural things out there. But boy, do we need Jesus. We really, really need Jesus. Jesus, beautiful in person, beautiful in heart, worthy of all worship and honor. Jesus, the most glorious person in history. Jesus, God, come in the flesh on earth. And he steps into our lives to touch, to restore, to renew, to deliver, to save, to justify. Jesus, overtopping all men and all women of all time. Jesus as the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last, with all the stupendous glory and power of heaven in his heart. Jesus is a king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be glory and honor and power forever and ever and ever. Amen and amen. And if you want Jesus right now, you know that you're lost, you know you've sinned, you know you blew it, this is your opportunity. You come to Christ and say, Jesus, you're my marvelous one. You're my savior. You're my redeemer. You're my Lord. And I turn from my past. I repent and I come to Christ anew as savior and Lord from this day forward forevermore. In Jesus name, amen and amen. Stay tuned for the next part of this program. Welcome to the Gospel Truth Show produced by Cross and Crown Radio. We want to make a lasting difference in your life and in our community. Our mission is to produce biblical, entertaining, and Christ-centered programs for God's people and folks all around the world. Post a comment or a question and sit back and enjoy the show. Gospeltruthshow.podbeam.com Remember, Judaism brings forth a woman caught in adultery. Where's the man? They don't bring the man. They bring the poor lady, throw her at Jesus' feet, and they demand that Jesus has her stone. And Jesus rescues the woman and says, He was without sin, throw the first stone. And nobody did. With Jesus, you see, complete liberty and freedom for the women. Although the church historically hasn't practiced it, we're starting to grow more and more into that. Yet the Bible still remains a document for liberation and freedom for women. And we need to grow towards it more and more. We see in history lots of problems with how the church and how Christians treated women. And yet that doesn't mean that Jesus wanted it different. Because he did. He wanted it completely different. Because with Jesus, you see some of his disciples were women. You see that women gave to his ministry, including some of Herod's palace women. They gave to Jesus' ministry. So did Martha and Mary, women. Now, notice, women were with Jesus at the cross when all the men scattered. The first evangelist in the Bible is found in John chapter 4. It's a woman, the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4. And after the resurrection of Jesus, the first evangelist is also a woman, Mary Magdalene. She goes, the angel says, and tells the good news of Christ's resurrection. So women are there for Jesus, and Jesus is there for women. You see nothing like that. In first century Judaism, you see nothing like that in Orthodox Judaism. You only see that as a foundational document of Christianity because of the imaginal day, the image of God. Men and women are created in the image and likeness of God. With that, let's go to a book that we can see the image of God shining forth 
in a couple ladies' life. In the book of Ruth. The book of Ruth is one of the sweetest, most tender stories ever told. It's a winsome tale of the life of two ladies and one getting married and both of them leaving their home for a long, long journey. Ruth is a daughter-in-law to Naomi. Naomi is a dear, mature Jewish lady who lost her husband and her sons. Ruth is her daughter-in-law who lost her husband. And Naomi is full of charm and courage. And Ruth is full of loyalty and faithfulness. In this book, God and the Holy Spirit's work are prefigured in essential characters. Naomi represents the Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit teaching and touching and leading and sustaining the believer. Somebody say, yes, sir. And Ruth represents a Christian, the believer. And Boaz, who's going to be her husband later, represents a picture of Jesus. Full of blessings and wealth. The kinsman redeemer, Boaz. Full of love and kindness, forgiveness and valor. That's Boaz. Jesus is the one who redeems us and supports us. And takes us despite our past, despite our sins, despite our mistakes, despite our flaws. Jesus takes us. And then he clothes us with his righteousness. Which is a form, an aspect of our justification. That we're declared righteous. Our sins are removed and we receive the righteousness of Christ. It's clothed upon us like Boaz is going to do Ruth with his mantle, with his shawl. He's going to cover Ruth, which means I want to marry you. And if you say, yes, all that I am and all that I have is yours. The righteousness of Christ is given to us. That's a symbol of what Boaz does for Ruth. Ruth, a Moabite woman, which means she's not Jewish. She's outside the covenants. And in this early section in Ruth, in chapter 1, we see the place where Naomi is trying to say goodbye to Ruth. Naomi lost her husband and her two boys, and now she has to say goodbye to her daughter-in-law. Then it's Ruth's time to say goodbye, and I can see Ruth as she flings her arms around the neck of Naomi and holds her tight and clings to it with her with all of her heart and with the tightness of her hands, and Naomi tells her, there, there, Ruth, no, 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 no. Go back to your country. Go back to your people. Remember, Ruth is a symbol of the Christian and Naomi is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. So Ruth clings only tighter. And then so tenderly and so sincerely. She speaks of her deep devotion for Naomi, her mother-in-law. Her steadfast love is manifest right there. But Naomi says, no, no, Ruth. It's time that I go and you stay. And Ruth's arms clung all the closer, with a grip all the tighter, with a devotion all the truer. Somebody say amen. For Ruth asked, Entreat me not to leave you or return to my hometown, but I want to be following you for where you go, I will go. Somebody praise the Lord. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. Somebody say, yes, sir. And where you die, I will die. And where you will be buried, I will be buried. You see complete commitment and faithfulness. And Ruth, what loyalty, what love, what a need expressed for the Holy Spirit. Because remember, Naomi is a type, a picture, a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God will be my God. And so they stay together. Warren Steiner was missing for 19 hours off the coast of New Jersey. Floating out there, floating out there, completely lost, had nobody to help him. And suddenly, he looks to his right, and there's an ice chest. Floats right by him. There's no boat, there's nothing around, but there's the ice chest. With some water in it. So he has something to drink and he has something to hold on to. So he holds on for 19 hours. He's able to do that because of that miracle. And when he's found, the Coast Guard says that Mr. Steiner was lucky to be found after 19 hours. No, God is sovereign and he was blessed. 19 hours in the middle of nowhere. But he trusted God. God can be trusted. You can trust God. You can say to the Father... I don't know all the things going on, but I trust you. So Naomi represents the Holy Spirit of God. And notice that she brings her people, she brings Ruth to, she brings the Christian to Bethlehem, which is a symbol of Jesus. 
That's the place Jesus was born. She brings Ruth to Bethlehem. Now, Naomi's a symbol, a type of the Holy Spirit. She prefigures the work of the Holy Spirit. For Naomi is so absolutely lovable. She's so winsome. And she leads you, Ruth. And she leads her home. Like the Holy Spirit leads us to Christ. And she finds a husband. If it wasn't for Naomi, Ruth would have lived and died a lost person in Moab as a non-Jewish person out of the covenants and promises. But she followed Naomi and she came to a husband and she found peace and joy. Naomi, the type of the Holy Spirit, the love, joy, and peace and patience and goodness. Such a picture of Naomi. And the Lord wants us to be like Naomi. Ladies, the Lord wants you to be like Naomi. Naomi had the fruit of the Spirit in large measure. And that's God's desire for you and I to be as Naomi. Hey guys, please subscribe to our channel. It really helps us a lot. Additionally, don't forget to join our Full Access Media Experience. We want you to know that Cross and Crown Full Access is now available for just $7.99 a month. Full Access provides an enjoyable Christian media experience. Every day we produce biblical, entertaining, and Christ-centered programs for you on demand. Sign up for Cross and Crown Full Access and get every television show, the after show, a free book monthly, and all our academic work at your command. All just one click away at gospeltruthshow.podbean.com. Help us reach the world. To be as Naomi, for right in here, right now, for you ladies, all across the world, right now, to pour out your heart to God and say, Lord, whatever disaster, whatever challenge, whatever trouble, whatever difficulty I'm facing, or I'm just facing a season of sunshine and blessing. Whatever it is, Lord, I need your spirit. I need your spirit in large measure in Jesus' name to influence my family and my marriage and my world and my job. I want to do that with the fruit of the spirit and the power of the spirit by pressing in to the Holy Spirit. Lord, make it happen even right now in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. To cry out, Lord, fill me. Lead me. Empower me, and God will do that. To so press in, to be so engrossed by God's Spirit, to have such a deep passion, devoted love, and communion with God every day because God is there, not just right now during the message, but let this flow every single day where you have to have the Spirit in your life to say, Lord, I need your Spirit. I yearn for your Spirit. I must have your spirits. And treat me not to leave thee. For where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Somebody shout glory. For Jesus said, the wind blows where it wills. You hear the sound thereof. But you don't know whether it's coming or whether it's going. So it is with the Holy Spirit. You follow the Holy Spirit. Not your flesh, not your own ideas. But God's word and the Spirit. Word and Spirit. And you say, God, you're my God. Where you go, I will go. And because Ruth pressed in, because Ruth embraced the grace and the charm of the Holy Spirit, as she embraced Naomi, God used her to build her life, to find a husband, to get her home together. And get this, because of all that, Ruth, get this, Ruth was a great, great grandmother, or the great grandmother, excuse me, of King David. No Ruth in Bethlehem, no King David. King David was from Bethlehem, and Jesus is the son of David. No Ruth in Bethlehem, no David, no David, no Messiah, Jesus. Now Jesus, of course, was God before that, but being born here on this planet as a Messiah, took Ruth to be in his genealogy. Ruth and David's genealogy culminated in the birth of Jesus Christ in Bethlehem over 2,000 years ago. Because of Ruth's persistence in pressing in to the Spirit. So Naomi is a picture of the Holy Spirit. is a symbol and a type of the Holy Spirit. And Ruth is a symbol and a picture of the Christian. Follower of Christ. Is a model for you ladies and all of us Christians. Ruth a maid servant. Full of humility and grace and loyalty. Winsome, virtuous, infused with charm and courtesy. Meek and strong. Somebody say glory. Ruth, the embracer of the Spirit, the follower 
of a betrothed. Naomi, a lady of peace and patience and love and joy and goodness and gentleness, a type of the Holy Spirit. With this story, I'm done. The story is told of a prince and his family who were captured by an enemy king. They were brought into the palace of the enemy king and flung at his feet. And the prisoner was asked by the king, What will you give me if I let you go? And the prince said, Half of all that I own. Then the enemy king asked the prince, What will you give me if I release your children? The humble prince said, Everything I own. And then the king looked the prince in the eye and said, what will you give me if I release your wife? Your majesty, for her, I give you my life unto death. The king was so moved by the defeated prince's devotion to his wife that he freed them all and sent them back home. And as he returned home, the prince said to his wife, Wasn't the king a good and handsome man? And with a look of deep love, she said, I didn't even notice. I couldn't keep my eyes off the one who was willing to give his life for me. And see, that's what Jesus did for you and I. And that's why we keep our eyes on Jesus, because he gave his life for us. Thanks for joining us at Life Church today. It's our joy to play a role in all God is doing in and through your life. We would love to continue with you on that journey. If you have any questions or prayer requests, visit lifechurchtoday.com or email us. We offer free counseling and a free Bible school because we train numerous people into ministry. Use your talents and answer God's call. God wants to do so much for you and through you. If you would like to give, click the donation button on the site. Pastor Robinson's 40 books are on Amazon. Good morning. Welcome to Abundant Life Community Church, the first part of the service. We're so glad that you're with us today. We have an exciting service, and we're going to be touching on some important topics that will change your life. We're so glad that you're listening mm -hmm. in Texas and around the world. Stick with us, because today I'm going to be talking about the dreadful day of the Lord. What's happening? Is it upon us? What can we do about it? How about all this eschatology? How about all this guesswork people are doing? Or can we keep it simple and powerful and move in the power of the Holy Spirit and see minds change, see hearts change, see lives change, and see society change? With that, go to Malachi chapter 4 and verse 1. Very, very important uh, subject here. For he says this, For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, and all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly, will stumble. And the day which is coming mm -hmm. shall burn them up. Notice it says all of them. Don't worry about all the, the, the folks out in the streets uh, creating mayhem. Pray for them. Let's get law and order in. Vote correctly. Yes, all those things are important, but you shouldn't worry about them. Prayer is powerful. God is powerful. The name of Jesus, that we invoke the shock and the awe of the power of the name of Jesus over our cities and over our nations, and not worry about all the craziness that's going out there, that we have love on our side. We have mercy on our side. We have truth on our side. Most of all, we follow the rider on the white horse, and that's Jesus. And we win. It's not a matter of who wins or not. It's a matter that love has to win and see it manifest in all of our lives. So notice it says that all, all of them who do wicked acts will stumble. So don't worry. Trust God. See his actions. Be part of the love. And then it says... That he will leave them neither root nor branch. They're in a tough spot. So they really, really need Jesus. And when you get to that point and someone offers you Jesus, many, many times they will come. Sometimes they'll keep going darker and darker. But many times they will come to Jesus. It's not for us to judge in that situation. It's for us to discern and to tell them what they should be doing and to repent and come to Christ and to love them. And then it says this, But to you who hear my name, the Son of Righteousness shall rise with healing in his wings. Wow. That's wonderful. That's what I need personally, and it's happening. That's what you need personally, whether it's mental, emotional, or physical, or just in our society, our culture. We need that healing. We need shalom. Shalom from God 
in your life and my life. I speak that in Jesus' name. Let the name of Jesus ride high and over all these things. Let it confound and overpower and overmaster all the dark, dreadful things in our society in Jesus' name. And then he says this, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And of course, the disciples were thinking about that in Acts chapter 1. Jesus dies on the cross. He's buried. And then by the power of God Almighty, he's risen from the dead. And that's not the end, because then he ascends to have it right in front of them. And we go to Acts chapter 1 to see that play out. And it says this, in Acts chapter 1, verse 3, to whom he presented himself alive after his sufferings by many infallible proofs. Notice that many infallible proofs. This is not guesswork. This is not a myth. This is true. This has proof. This has evidence. No other religion, no other faith has that evidence. Only Christ does, and it's massive. It's colossal. It's powerful. It's life-changing, and it's going to change our world as it has been for 2,000 years. So he presents himself with many infallible proofs, being seen during the 40 days, speaking of things pertaining, notice this, pertaining to the kingdom of God. Is that what you are doing? Is that what I'm doing? Am I just floating around, flowing in my own area, in my own ideas, in my own actions? Or am I moving in the kingdom of God, which is power and might and love and helps people? People desperately need Jesus. You've seen them. You drive by them. So often we don't care about them. They're our co-workers. We're not too busy for them. They're out there, our neighbors. We, we have to get to our dinner. We don't care about them. We need to start caring. Lord, help us care in Jesus' name. Lord, help us really, really care as you do, Jesus. Then he goes on to say, now, when he had spoken these things, that's Jesus, when they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. And he said, You men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, who was taken up from you unto heaven, will come in like manner as you saw him go to heaven. Keep it that simple. Christ is coming again. You know it. Can't you just wait to see him break through that sky? In the meantime, let us break through in the kingdom of God with love, preaching the gospel, extending mercy, seeing us move with the power of the Spirit that will just absolutely blow the minds of the unbelievers. When they see these things, they'll say, I don't care about any superpowers or supernatural powers that other people seem to have in comic books and stuff. This is the real thing. This is the real deal. So, Father, in Jesus' name, we ask you, Lord, to fill us with your Spirit, that we would be men and women of the Spirit. We would be men and women of truth. We would be men and women of grace and mercy, that we would extend shalom all over the world. And if you don't know Jesus, come to him right now. Cast away all your nonsense. Cast away all your religiosity. Cast away all your idols. Cast away all the things that don't matter. It doesn't matter what your background is. Push it aside, throw it away, and repent and come to Jesus and say, Father, I believe in Jesus. I believe he's the Son of God and the Son of Man. I believe he died on the cross for all my sins, that he was buried, and God raised him from the dead. I give my whole heart my whole life. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. And please join us for the rest of the service under Pastor George. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>